We're going to talk today about uh, the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Uh, this is known as the Chicxulub uh, impact in the impact crater, and it's in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, down in Mexico. And I've got some sort of personal experience with this one. Uh, I wasn't there 66 million years ago, but uh, I, my wife and I, back in 2009, uh, had the opportunity to travel uh, to Mexico, uh, to Cancun, Mexico. And uh, one of my reasons that I really wanted to go to Cancun uh, wasn't so much for the beaches and all the reasons most people would go to Cancun. Uh, as my wife will tell you, I drag her around the planet most of the time just looking for various bits and pieces of rocks and various land formations and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, uh, we flew into uh, Cancun, Mexico. Uh, and one of my goals really was I wanted to see some of the evidence uh, for the, the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to kind of take you through some of the locations and some of the places I visited a little bit just so you can kind of get a feel for uh, what it looks like here. Some of you might have been to Cancun, Mexico. Uh, that's the, the coast there. That's sort of the hotel region that you see in the picture out of the, the airplane that I took. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a pretty cheap trip for us. It was uh, one of the first big trips my wife and I did. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, and uh, we needed some place that we could travel to uh, pretty cheaply and get around. Uh, so we depended most, almost entirely on uh, the bus system uh, in Mexico and Belize and, and throughout the area, and it worked really quite well. Uh, but anyway, we landed in Cancun, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, if you get an opportunity and you get to go there, uh, try and actually go inland a little ways. Uh, go to the actual town of Cancun. Uh, and see what it's really like for the people that live there. Uh, because I'll tell you right now, the, the hotel strip where most folks stay uh, is pretty Americanized. It, it does not really look much like the rest of Mexico. It's very different. Um, but yeah, get in and explore a little bit if you get a chance to ever to go someplace like this. Um, so anyway, we landed in Cancun, and then we traveled to a location known as Merida. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I don't speak any Spanish, well, very, very little anyway, and uh, which made traveling pretty interesting. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, my wife and I with our backpacks traveling all around Mexico, uh, stopping into various bus stations, and I would write down the location of where we wanted to go, and I'd hand it to the person at the booth up there and uh, try and you know, indicate that we needed some tickets to get to that location. And uh, they would give me some tickets, and I would just kind of wander around and show those to various bus drivers until somebody kind of motioned me to get on and then we would hop on and start traveling and the mexican bus system uh it's phenomenal like compared to american buses uh in mexico they do it right they they really have nice buses in fact sometimes uh we'd get on a bus to go someplace uh just to have the relief of having the air conditioning because uh, it is really hot there it is tough if you've never had to sleep in heat like that without air conditioning uh, boy, that's something. It is, it, it's really tough. Uh, but the, the buses are just cush. I mean, bathrooms, like beautiful seats, air conditioning, gorgeous windows, always on time. Uh, very different than American bus systems for the most part. Anyway, uh, this is Merida. It's downtown. Uh, it was a really crazy hot city. The, the hostel we stayed in there was super hot. Of course, no air conditioning, no fans, nothing like that. Um, but it was a place to sleep uh, for like, it was like, $12 a night. It's pretty cheap, right? For the two of us. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see it's, it's a pretty city. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, I, we didn't walk the whole thing, but we walked around quite a bit. Um, it, nothing too spectacular as far as like geology goes, other than the fact that this is really close to the location where the impact actually at the center of the impact site. It's well within the impact crater itself. But as you can see, there's no crater, right? So where the heck is the crater? Well, the crater is buried under so much ocean floor and sediment uh, that you, you would never know that it's there. And that's why scientists had such a difficult time discovering this thing. It wasn't until we were drilling for oil that we really found uh, the location of this thing. Because on the surface, it doesn't look like anything. Um, and I'm going to show you guys some maps, and it'll make some a little bit more sense. But here, I'm going to show you here a, a video that I just shot of some of the locations I'm actually talking about so you can place them geographically on the map. 
but we traveled from Merida to a small town, uh, not town, a small location uh, known as Ushmal, I think is how it's pronounced, um, U-X-M-A-L. And there were some awesome pyramids there that we got to climb all over the place and, and check out. It was really pretty cool. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, from there, we traveled back to the coast and down the coast all the way to Belize uh, to visit what's the most uh, proximal, the, the closest location to the actual impact site where there's actually exposed material from the impact. So here in Merida, um, anywhere around here, you can't actually find rock that's been altered or blown out of this crater. It's just missing. It's, it, it was all vaporized. Um, and the stuff that wasn't vaporized was blown so far away that I literally had to travel to Belize to actually find uh, where the stuff was exposed at the Earth's surface um, and not buried or just completely absent. So let me show you this little video here. It'll hopefully make some sense of as to where I'm talking about, where we're at and located. You might recognize this map because it's the same one that you guys uh, were working on uh, earlier with the impacts and extinctions event activity that we did. Um, this one's not quite finished, so the points that you're seeing there, are, they're not all done. It was the one I was using to help demonstrate uh, how to do that activity with you guys. But remember, you plotted the shocked quartz distribution and you plotted the ejected depth distributions uh, kind of around the planet, and it helped you zero in on the location of that impact crater. And looking at the whole Earth here, um, it was uh, very obvious, hopefully, to you that the location of that impact that wiped out the dinosaurs roughly 66 million years ago was in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, down here in Mexico. And some of you maybe have been to Mexico. Uh, most folks travel to Cancun. And uh, I, just because I've been talking about these places, I want you to kind of see where they're at on the map. Let's zoom out again here. Here's Indiana. And so if we kind of come down here across the Gulf of Mexico, um, here is all of Mexico. And then let's zoom in just here on the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, most flights, uh, the flight that I took out here actually landed in Cancun because that's the cheapest place to actually land. That's where all the beaches are, where everybody kind of likes to go out here in the hotel zone. Uh, it's a really interesting town, though, if you ever get a chance to go. Uh, head in here to the interior and check out uh, what the city is actually like. It's a really neat, uh, interesting city, but my wife and I were staying in some hostels uh, here in town uh, when we first first arrived, um, and then we headed out from there on the uh, buses. So uh, as we traveled, we one place that I really, really wanted to go, uh, just to say that I had stood there, was to, a, nearest as I could get, the center of the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. I thought, you know, how cool would that be? So. Anyway, if we kind of roll over here to Merida, uh, Merida is really close. It's the only place we could get a bus to uh, since we didn't have a vehicle while we were there. Uh, but we stayed here in the city in Merida uh, just to kind of say, hey, you know, we've been to uh, this location where the dinosaurs were extinct, you know, where, that wiped out um, a huge mass extinction on our planet. And it was a city, uh, but pretty hot, actually. The actual location uh, that where the dinosaurs, where the uh, meteor struck, is up here in the, right up here in what's called the, the port of Chicxulub, uh, Chicxulub uh, Porto, I believe is what it says there, um, and we can zoom in here. Right here in this, this is roughly what, this is what the crater is named after, this town here. Uh, and it's also the, the closest, it is essentially the center of the impact. As near as we can tell from core samples and magnetic resonance, um, that's the center of the crater. So you can see if that's the center, an awful lot of it, uh, basically half or more, is out here in the ocean, right? And the rest of it's up here on, on land um, present day today. But the fact that this was shallow ocean played a big role in uh, wiping out life on the planet because uh, of the materials that it blasted up into the atmosphere and the angle that it hit at, uh, it of course caused, uh, there was sulfur bearing rock down there and all that sulfur got blown up into the atmosphere and created um, some really bad situation, you know, with blocking out the sunlight, um, the acid rain, of course, uh, pretty much doomsday to all life on the planet. Um, you can also imagine, you know, if something impacted right here, the effect that would have on the ocean, 
right? The waves that went across this Gulf of Mexico, they were humongous tidal waves uh, traveling at tsunamis, if you will, the more pro appropriate term, traveling uh, hundreds of miles per hour across the Gulf uh, and slamming into the coast of Texas over here and hurling boulders the sizes of cars up onto the, the banks up here. So in some of that video that you guys watched, uh, they talk about uh, these locations up here, and you probably have some that you marked on your map, uh, where they're finding material that's ocean floor that was got picked up from a humongous wave and tossed inland up here. Uh, and we can find that material and date it right back to uh, this 66 million year old impact site down here in the Yucatan. So uh, what I did while I was here, I was in, in Merida, it was awesome. Uh, I also, I wanted to see the, the closest or the, the, the most proximal uh, exposed material uh, to the site. So this is all completely underground and underwater. You can't actually see a crater here. And even looking at the ocean floor, which you can see really great through Google Maps here, uh, there's no crater right there there's nothing there it's covered in ocean sediment and ocean floor uh, to find that thing we had to drill down and of course we found the brescia the impact uh, impact cracked rock down there uh, we, we found the shocked quartz um, and today I'm going to show you on a map uh, here but there's actually a ring of cenotes that kind of outline this crater and in fact looking at the ejecta um, the size of it here it's it you know I don't have it all marked on the map but it's definitely thicker closer to the impact site here now how far do you have to go if you want to actually see material that was blown out of this crater which you can't see even if you stand in Merida or in Chicxulub uh, you've got to go quite a ways let me pull that up here I'm going to turn the other part of my map on I plotted this out for you here so check this out if I draw a line from here to the nearest location where there's any material exposed, it's way the heck down here in the tip of Belize. So yeah, my my wife and I, when we were here in Merida, we we traveled uh, by bus. We got dropped off down here briefly in Ushmal and uh, saw some really awesome uh, pyramids that I'll, I'll show you some pictures of there, some awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, and then we ended up taking a bus I believe that went kind of out this direction it was kind of funny because I'm navigating on this bus with my map and compass hoping we're going the right way because I had no idea uh, if the if we got on the right bus or not since I don't speak a whole lot of Spanish um, so we traveled all the way over here to the coast uh, let me see if I can figure out where we ended up here in Tulum somehow I guess we went off this direction back here that's the way the buses went and then we headed on down here all the way down into Belize and we went into this small town called Orange Walk. Uh, nowhere near the, the really pretty parts of Belize. Most folks go out here near the coast where there's all this awesome diving. There's the all these caves. There's the blue hole. Uh, just some really amazing stuff. Um, but over here in Orange Walk, really out of the way, way tiny little town, <laughs> middle of nowhere. Um, I'll show you some photos here of where we went uh, down this river. We traveled this river system it was really pretty neat uh, down to some pyramids down here I don't remember how far down we went but it was a good ways but anyway uh, I hired a cabbie to take me from Orange Walk all the way out almost back to Mexico uh, it's actually not too far from the border but over to this place right here known uh, as Albion Island and I have no idea why it's called Albion Island other than that if you look at the rivers here, it kind of, there's a river on either side of it, so it's kind of separated from the rest of the land in a way. Um, but I guess that's why they call it Albion Island. You actually had to cross a little bridge here, but this is all dirt roads all the way out here. You can kind of tell that from the map a little bit, this tiny little bridge. Uh, and then all through the little town here. And out just beyond this town uh, is this uh, quarry where they're, they're mining uh, limestone and uh, I'll show you some photos from inside this quarry here, but this is where we traveled to and uh, got to see some actual material that was blown out of that crater, flew through the air, and landed down here. How far is that? Well, this line, to give you an indication right here that I just drew, this straight line, i got to keep zooming out here, 
this straight line is 230 miles away. So you've got to go almost 250 miles uh, from the actual impact site to find material that landed from it. Um, that's a long, long ways away. And keep in mind, a lot of this stuff that rained down here uh, was glass, like it was molten, and it landed here. Uh, but there were boulders, and I've got, maybe I have a picture of one, uh, that were literally the size of, you know, like a Volkswagen Beetle uh, that had landed here. Uh, flown through the air just to think that stuff about that stuff moving that far across the landscape um, in landing way down here that had to be just a, I mean and it was a, a planet-wide event like that impact right there but that gives you kind of an idea of of the scale here the actual crater itself is is pretty small in comparison to all this maybe about like EEA big-ish um, but uh, major impact on our planet right there you have it. Okay, so uh, taking a look at the crater itself, this picture will give you kind of an indication of uh, what what the rim of it actually looks like. Uh, the, so Merritt is there, that little dot there, and then you can see uh, Porto uh, Chicxulub right there in the kind of near the tip. Uh, so the plus sign there is, is where we think essentially the center of the, the crater is. But with magnetic resonance, you can actually see there's like a double rim inside the crater. So it's kind of, you can almost think of uh, like what happens if you drop a rock in a puddle or in a pond or if you drop just a drop of water into some water and, and captured it in slow motion. You'd see as it entered, it would kind of well up around the outside edges and then the center would kind of go up and fall back down again. So you get this kind of double, sort of double uh, walled sort of appearance. It almost looks like dropping something into water. Um, but that's the, the difference in the rock that's beneath the ocean floor and the land um, itself. Now, if you look over there where it says Cenote Ring, just underneath where it says Merida, there's a ring and there's all these little white dots that travel from one edge of the land all the way around to the other edge. I'm going to show you another map of that. Uh, but what a cenote is, is a big, uh, basically it's a, a, a Spanish word for a sinkhole. It's these giant sinkholes uh, that, was, that actually are, are filled with water for the most part, cracked in the limestone itself. So a lot of that's limestone. It was ocean floor. Um, and you know that caves form, of course, uh, when you have cracked limestone and water percolating through that. Uh, so this is essentially one gigantic cave system with all these big giant holes opening up to the sky. Um, and that's what the Mayans and the Incas actually used for water. That, that was the water source because this is like, this is jungle. And there's not a lot of rivers and things around this area. Um, the ocean, you can't drink ocean water. The only fresh water was really in these cenotes. And they are impressive looking things. Um, I got to go diving in some. I'll show you some pictures. But you can see it perfectly. I mean, perfectly outlines the ridge of that, the rim of that crater where that thing impacted. Um, so it's pretty cool that we can do that today. So uh, looking at a bigger picture of uh, sort of what uh, that looks like, the, the outer rim of the crater's got a diameter of about 180 kilometers uh, that the inner, what they call the transient crater, that inner ring, uh, has about a hundred. It's about a hundred kilometers in diameter. <clears throat> so the the hole itself, which is not a hole anymore, the actual impact. It's. I mean, it's it's huge, but it's not big like globally. Like a lot of the time, I think people picture uh, this rock from space just as this gigantic thing that just made this humongous hole in our planet. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be big to cause planet-wide destruction. As long as it hits us at the right location, going at the right angle, the effects can be catastrophic to the entire ecosystem, right? Uh, since everything's dependent on the sun, if you block that out and everything's dependent on the producers, if you kill them, basically all life dies. Um, it, it, was a, it was a bad one. So anyway, I want to show you some photos from kind of around the, the area and places that I, I traveled. I told you that I traveled there from Merida down to Ushmal, uh, which was a really cool uh, place. We were all alone there, my wife and I, for the most part, and you, you could just, 
literally it was totally okay to just walk around and check out all these cool pyramidal structures from the ancient Mayan ruins. Uh, just amazing, amazing place. But there's me. If you look close, you'll see me standing at the top of one of these things. Uh, and I got to say, you know, you almost kind of felt profane climbing these if you know anything about the the history of the Mayans and things like that, because the the commoners, the, the regular old people in Mayan villages would had to live beneath these monolithic structures. Like you were down there on the bottom in these little, you know, grass huts. You didn't live up there. And the only people that could travel to the top of that would have been the high priests, like the ruling class. And up top, you know, that's where, you know, they might have had sacrifices and rolled heads and bodies down those things. But like that was where the gods were. You didn't just get to go up that. So it was almost a really weird feeling uh, just hiking up to the top of one of those things. Uh, but it was beautiful. I mean, you could see over the entire jungle from the tops of those. Uh, and, and like I said, my wife and I are at this humongous area that is a little reserve. And just walking around, you could see places where they were currently excavating and putting recreating areas. Uh, but I guarantee you a lot of those blocks have been replaced because it was just uh, destroyed. It does not take long in a jungle for the plants to completely overgrow everything and start to destroy all the ruins that are there. So uh, to preserve all those archaeological artifacts, uh, a lot of that's had to have been rebuilt uh, to make it look right. But it's super duper impressive. And I told you that we traveled there from Ushmal um, over to near the coast again, uh, where I had contacted some folks to uh, convince them to take me diving into some of these cenotes. And uh, here's what a small opening to a cenote might look like. Uh, some of the other ones that I went into were humongous, gigantic craters in the earth, like huge, like couldn't have walked across them, like gigantic, gigantic holes. Uh, but this just descends down. They put the, built this ladder down uh, into the sand. This was called Dos Ojos, the Bat Cave, maybe. And uh, you'd go down that thing and you dropped in with your scuba gear and you were in fresh water uh, traveling around underneath all this stuff. I got some. I had an underwater camera with me through most of this stuff, and not a single photo turned out, unfortunately. Um, but it was really, really cool. <coughs> but and like once again, most of these cenotes, a lot of them are formed because this is limestone, and the bedrock got cracked. The bottom of the ocean floor got cracked when that impact occurred, and it cracked it in that rim. And then later, as the land was uplifted and whatnot, uh, water formed cave systems, and there are underground cave systems, some of the longest cave systems possibly uh, in the world. Uh, they've not even been completely uh, scouted out because they're all underwater. But yeah, we went to this this place, uh, and they actually had some other uh, really cool stuff. Uh, the one thing that I was super impressed with the entire time we were in Mexico traveling around was just the sheer ingenuity of the Mexican people. Like they they could take something that. You, as Americans, we might just throw away, throw in the trash and say, forget about, and repurpose it into something that was completely useful um, in a totally new way. Uh, so like they were driving us around in these buggies uh, that they had built, we call them jungle buggies, because they just literally had kind of nailed two by fours together and put an old truck engine on this thing and put some axles on it. And the, the fuel tank was like a Gatorade bottle <laughs> you know, and it was just all kind of cobbled together and it, it worked, you know, it actually went. But one of the things that they had built, which I found really cool, they had suspended these lines, uh, these steel cables through the jungle. And then they took apart old bicycles and welded the, the bicycle parts onto this hanging contraption uh, that had a little belt on it to drive it. Uh, and it was connected up to the top. You can't quite see. Um, and you could pedal your way through the jungle on this thing. There's, there's probably no way this would be considered uh, <laughs> allowed to be safe in, in most American places. But it was really sweet. Oh, my gosh. So we hopped on these, like, jungle bikes and pedaled through the jungle canopy. And it was just, just beautiful. There was a little brake, handbrake on there. Uh, but as I found out really quick, mine did not work. <laughs> so and if you took your feet off of that and you were going downhill... I, it was probably going to be death. It would take a leg off for sure because those those uh, pedals would start spinning so fast. But uh, I got a chance to pedal, and they'd actually run them down and through uh, cave systems, which was just so cool. Check this out. It's my wife ahead of me if you look up there. Um, <clears throat> but we just got to pedal through all this stuff. It was really, really neat. In fact, uh, going through this cave right here, I look up, and there's all these things up in the ceiling. 
Uh, those aren't your tiny average, average everyday little Indiana brown bats. I don't know what kind of bats those are, but they're about five times the size of one of our bats. They were humongous and just right there in your face, you know, but really cool. Um, and I think I've got, I think this might be a little video. I don't know. I don't think it is, but there's a picture of me. Um, <clears throat> you see my little handbrake up top there, which did not function whatsoever, uh, but really cool uh, to go ride that thing through the jungle. Just really, really neat. Anyway, uh, like I said, we traveled throughout Mexico um, <clears throat> on the bus system, which was, which was quite a trip for us because neither of us spoke Spanish. And uh, I just pretty much have to kind of <laughs> bumble my way through and hope that I was on the right bus and then, you know, get my compass out while I was on the bus and my maps and say, okay, or look at the sun. Are we going in the right direction that we're supposed to be going? Do I need to be worried? Um, when do I need to get off of this bus? How long have we been traveling for? So this is way before we had, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have like, you know, Google Maps to help us find our way around. There wasn't anything like that, at least that we had. So it was uh, pretty old school, uh, but really neat. Now, one of the things that happened is I told you that we went from Mexico all the way down to Belize because I wanted to see actual exposed material from the impact. So in order to do that, we had to go through customs, which was kind of interesting getting into um, Belize off of a bus system. But we transferred from a, a Mexican bus onto a Belizean bus. And I was, I was excited, I got to say, because uh, English is the official language of Belize. Um, unofficially, very few people in a lot of the places we were at spoke any English whatsoever. So it still was really difficult to get around. Um, but we managed to transfer through customs and uh, hop onto a different bus. Uh, and the buses are very different in Belize compared to Mexico. As I said before, Mexico has this phenomenal bus system. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's so nice. I wish we had a system like that in America. Um, in Belize, uh, you ride what they call chicken buses. So a chicken bus looks a little bit like this. And this was a nice one, to be honest. I'm convinced this is where Bluebird school buses go to die, or be reborn maybe. But if you notice in America, you don't see very many old Bluebird school buses anymore. We used to ride these things maybe when I was a kid, maybe even before that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if they were deemed unsafe or something and all shipped to Belize. I'm not sure really what happened, um, but these things are pretty rough. You can notice up there the, the bus drivers got some little uh, window shade dingle ball things hanging across the top there. Um, they call these things chicken buses because sometimes you are literally on these things with a bunch of chickens. Uh, sometimes they throw your gear on top. We, we managed to get on this pretty nice one here, but it was so packed. I was really worried because you just keep packing on until nobody can, somebody can't fit. And then there might be some people hanging off the outside. I was on this bus. My wife actually had a seat, I think. Um, I don't know where. And I was up at the front, like right behind the driver in order to fit. I was hanging, one arm was over the driver's shoulder, my other arm was out the window, and most of my head, because pressed up against me, was another woman's <laughs> pretty much trying to be crunched onto this tiny little bus. Uh, it's actually a big bus, but it was a lot of people packed onto this thing. It was pretty funny. Anyway, we're driving through um, Belize, and it was an entire day's journey to get from Tulum all the way down here to where we were going in Belize. And by the time we got down to where we were going, it was quite dark. And as it got dark, the driver, uh, he was having a heck of a good time. He kicked on the, the beats and had, this, had his music pumping. And then he had wired up Christmas lights all around the inside of the bus and hooked them into his stereo system. So the Christmas lights were, were popping to the beat while he's driving this thing. And, and he is not going slow. And we were ripping through tiny little towns and over little streets and through potholes and it was it was quite a trip but eventually we landed ourselves down uh, in Orange Walk Belize and Orange Walk like I said before it's nowhere near uh, anything that most people who would go to Belize to, to go do some tourism would go uh, it's really in, in interior sort of middle of nowhere and uh, we found this little hostel here uh, it was really cheap and uh, it was run by, uh, um, by this uh, little old lady here uh, who was actually Chinese. And um, almost, it was interesting because a lot of the things in, in the town 
were Chinese. Like you go and you could buy a newspaper. Well, it wasn't in English. It wasn't in Spanish. Um, it was all in Chinese. I thought, boy, that's really strange. Uh, come to find out later on, talking with some of my friends and talking with some of the people around here, uh, a lot of the areas in the interior in Belize are actually run by various bits of the Chinese mafia. So there's kind of a, a Belizean drug trade and there's some sketchy areas in, in certain sections of Belize. And I don't know if we were in a, a terribly great spot, but uh, the location we were at uh, had, had bars on the windows and inside of our tiny little room, there were bars all over those windows. And everything was kind of bolted down. Um, so uh, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we weren't in the greatest part of town, uh, but it was, it was real cheap and it was close to where I was trying to go. Um, so uh, we were planning, we were, the plan was to visit uh, this location where there was material ejected from the impact site, uh, but also we had an opportunity because one of the guys that was actually staying here, there's only one other person in this building with us, uh, he had worked out with a, another with, with some guy to take him on a boat ride um, down to some pyramids. And, uh, and he just needed some more people to come along. So he was talking to us and we we're like, oh, heck yeah, we totally want to do that. And so we hooked up with this guy and um, hopped on this boat. And we rode this boat uh, all the way down this river a good, good long ways. And it was, it was awesome. I mean, it's just jungle on all sides. You're looking out. And as you're heading down, you look over. And there's, you know, like a family in a canoe. And if you look close, uh, that is not your typical Kevlar or <laughs> aluminum canoe right there. That's a full-on dugout canoe. Like that is burned and chipped out of a log right there. Um, and he's paddling with like a handmade paddle there. I'm not sure what they were doing if they were fishing, probably fishing um, along there. But it was, uh, it was dangerous along the edge there, especially along this river. You had to be careful because there were lots of places where we, we saw crocodiles uh, just sort of hanging out uh, on the shore. That was a little one right there. Um, further down, the, the guy that was driving the boat, he's like, hey, you can jump in and go for a swim. And I was like, I don't know, man, those, those things might come after me. Uh, but we swam for a little bit. It was fun. Uh, we pulled the boat over to the shore at one spot. And... Uh, just this ruckus happens in the trees, and out of the trees uh, pops a spider monkey uh, who's just hanging out. I mean, I, I was leaning backwards, literally leaning backwards to take this photo. This thing was in my face. Um, obviously, it knew that this guy uh, would pull up because it knew this guy had bananas. And as soon as he pulled out a banana, that monkey was on that boat. It was clambering over me and everybody else just to run back there and grab that banana. Uh, but it was pretty cool to be up close and personal with a spider monkey, right, right in your face. Uh, other cool things we saw, we got down to these uh, pyramids, or these, these ruins, um, and it was just spectacular. I mean, absolutely spectacular. But leaf cutter ants, how cool is that? Whole string of little ants carrying little leaves back to their little uh, ant mounds so that they can grow fungus on them and feed themselves. But these, these ruins were, were really pretty cool, probably neater than the ones in Ushmal in the sense that you walked back to them literally through a jungle. Like you, you were like bushwhacking your way back. Um, and it, it was pretty steep in, in going up. There's a small group of people with us here. And you can see like they actually hung a rope because it was so steep to go up some of these things. And up on top, you're looking out and it's just jungle as far as you can see. It's just amazing, spectacular jungle. Um, but anyway, that's not really the reason we went down there. I just kind of wanted to put things in perspective, sort of where we were at a little bit. The real reason we went down uh, was to visit this location uh, in Albion Island uh, of a quarry, uh, literally in the middle of nowhere, uh, to see the material that was ejected from the impact. And uh, how did I find this thing? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I was reading uh, some journal articles about where to, about, about the impact site and about material from the impact site. And I found some references uh, to a study that a bunch of NASA scientists had done who had come down here to try and locate material from the crater because nobody really knew where there was any exposed, like it's really buried. Um, so uh, I contact, I actually managed to contact this NASA scientist and he hooked me up 
uh, with the location as best as he could describe it, and then with a bunch of searching uh, maps online, I managed to pinpoint that spot that I showed you guys on the map. Uh, the woman who was running our, our, our hotel proprietor, she, she helped me out a bunch because she, uh, she loaned me a hammer and a chisel and, uh, and uh, actually managed to find a, a cabbie for me who would take me out there because most people who drive cabs aren't going to take you, you know, out into the middle of the jungle. So I uh, convinced some guy to drive my wife and I out, out there. And we, we arrived here. Uh, and it was really pretty cool. There's a little guard shack, um, and the guys there, they were like, well, hey, there's no, uh, we weren't really sure what to expect, and they were like, well, there's no active blasting going on today, so you're okay to walk around, because we didn't know if we'd arrive there, because they, they mine this stuff with dynamite, and, and if they were blasting, they sure as heck weren't going to let us go walk around, and, you know, but, but they were pretty surprised. They, they, they remembered the NASA scientists, which were, was pretty cool. Uh, but other than the folks from NASA, nobody had ever visited them at their little quarry out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, so uh, they, they hooked us up with these little hard hats, and we kind of headed out uh, to wander around this quarry where they were doing the mining. And if you look close, uh, kind of in the back, I wish I could point to it, uh, there's a, like a line in the rocks. You can see like a bedding plane that goes horizontally. It's a little bit lighter color than the stuff on top and the stuff on the bottom. It's almost right in the middle of that rock wall there in the back. And you can see a little bit of it above that equipment there on the left-hand side. So uh, that's essentially the layer that, that I was looking for uh, to get back there. And I'll show you some, some diagrams of that in a second. But uh, here's me out hiking in my, uh, my climbing shoes there. You know, flip-flops are pretty good, but uh, I did have a blowout while we were there, so that was a little problematic. So anyway. Uh, looking at that, if you look at that big white thing there, that white thing uh, is, you can kind of see the edges of it if you look carefully. It used to be one complete boulder uh, that was blown into the air. Look at the size of that thing. And it landed all the way down there in Belize. Like, that is a long ways away from where it started out up there in Chicxulub. Uh, and you can kind of see the boundary of it. If you look real close, you see the white, where the white meets the kind of beige color. Uh, that's the boundary of that big boulder. And it's all cracked up. Remember, this stuff's like 65 million years old, uh, so it's pretty weathered, right? Um, let's take another look here. Here's further down the quarry, and you can see that, that layer. I am right at that layer. And the stuff that I'm picking out of there is material uh, that rained down out of the sky. Um, the little white thing in my hand there is actually a piece of melted glass uh, that's weathered now and become mostly clay minerals and things like that uh, that fell from the sky. Remember, this is like raining fire and hell um, from this impact. Hundreds of miles away from the impact site, it's raining hellfire. Um, the stuff up above there um, is, is known as dimictite which is essentially like a, a sort of unconsolidated sort of brescia sort of material. Um, all that stuff up above that line there is, is material that also um, fell down from the sky, right? The later stuff, the, the, this like kind of bigger chunky stuff. And it's all kind of cobbled up there. Like I said, uh, I'll show you some closer ups of this stuff here in a minute. Had a blowout, but luckily my, my wife saved me with her, her knitting that she had on hand. So my, my sandal managed to make it uh, till the end. Anyway, a uh, lot of pictures here of me. There's I've got one of the little pebbles in my hand there. Another picture of the that line. You can see the layer there, right? It, it's right almost level with the ground, and then it goes out and extends out a little bit. That lightish colored layer um, is the layer that we're talking about. Let's take a look at the little overlay here. This is one of the drawings from the NASA study. <coughs> so you can see the what's called the spheroid bed. That's that little thin layer that's in front of me there. And up above that is that larger uh, dimictite bed. So that like there's big boulders, there's big chunks of stuff that rain down from the sky. The spheroids are, are much smaller melted glass particles that are all kind of mixed in there. And underneath that is lots of other layers of ancient seafloor, right? Essentially, there's fossils down there. There's fossil crabs, gastropods. I didn't see any of that stuff. I think it's pretty far down um, in the rock units. 
Uh, maybe it was harder to find, but <clears throat> a little bit closer up view of that. So uh, the dimictite bed, you know, there's a, a sudden appearance of all these cobbles and a definite change in the matrix there. But let's look closer there at the, um, at the spheroid bed because I'm going to show you a few of those. Oh, you might notice some of the other words there. Uh, in the Barton's Creek formation, uh, you'll see there's a, that's Cretaceous material. Okay, so that's the, the, the KT boundary. K stands for Cretaceous in German. Sorry. So it's not a C, it's a K. But the word is spelled Cretaceous in, in English. And uh, that's, there's tan dolomite there. You recognize the word dolomite. That's like essentially really old magnesium-rich limestone. This is ocean floor down there. But let's look up there at the uh, spheroid bed. Um, in, oh, there's a great photo there of uh, Albion Island and uh, the, the actual crater rim there. It's a little bit large, I think. The crater rim's not quite, yeah, maybe that's close. Uh, might be a little big comparison. But um, let's look there up at the, at the uh, spheroid bed. And you can see if we start at the bottom there, it's like 15 to 20 centimeters of sort of these green, green clay spheroids uh, up, up to about a centimeter in diameter. Uh, there's dolomite. Um, they're kind of flattened more parallel, lying more parallel. Above that, um, there's about 25 to 40 centimeters thick of sort of more flattened dolomite spheroids with a little bit of foliation. So it looks a little bit almost metamorphosed, right? Uh, about sort of some ch ch chalky white angular dolomite clasps in there, and I've got some of those. Up above that, uh, there's 40 to 50 centimeters thick of sort of spherical to slightly oblate dolomite spheroids with some real distinct foliation going on. And then above that, uh, it's got sort of the same composition as, as the one as number three there, but uh, no foliation. So there's like layers within this thing. Uh, it was really neat to kind of see that because what those are, those spheroids are melted materials that fell from the sky for the most part. There's the spheroid bed a little closer. And here's my lovely wife and I hanging out in our, our hard hats there that they hooked us up with and my borrowed hammer and my borrowed chisel uh, working away down there. When we got back, uh, I, had to, I had to sort out my, my shoe situation because the only shoes I really had were my flip-flops. Was, it was so hot, I didn't really need anything else. Um, so we went to the grocery store, uh, which we realized really quickly um, was selling all kinds of, mostly stuff from China. Uh, but we, I got a great pair of Nikes here. And these are definitely knockoffs. It's pretty funny because those are definitely not Nike sandals. They just crudely sewed a Nike swoosh onto a pair of random sandals that somebody had made. Uh, but there was stuff like that everywhere. You could just you could buy things with a Nike symbol sewn on or an Adidas symbol or, or stuff like that. It was pretty funny. Um, but anyway, that was my uh, visit all the way down to, uh, from Cancun all the way down to Belize to see material that came out of the crater that wiped out the dinosaurs. Hi guys, so I got out some maps and I want to show you some of the area down in the Yucatan where uh, this impact occurred. So here we go. Uh, here are some of the maps. I've got quite a few here. This is the most important one uh, that I carried with me when I was down in Mexico. And these are geological maps. So to give you sort of an indication here, let's take a look at the key. <clears throat> Not only are they geological maps, which might look weird to you, but they're also in Spanish, uh, which was difficult for me because other than the rock terminology, um, a lot of it was, uh, I had some of my students actually translate for me to help me out. But you can see there the Cenozoico, the Tertiario, the uh, Paleogeno. <laughs> so, um, Really similar, so you just have to kind of interpret a little bit as you go, but a lot of this stuff's pretty similar. And there are a few Spanish words um, that are actually geological terms everybody recognizes. Uh, but anyway, uh, what the different colors on this map show are the different periods of geological time. <clears throat> so 
the Cenozoic, of course, being recent time. Uh, so back here would be the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. This just shows surface exposure. So that's why it's not got, doesn't have stuff on it as old as the dinosaurs, right? This is, this is surface material. But anyway, I'll give you a quick little close up here. There's where we're at. This is Mexico. The U.S. is up here. And we're over here in the peninsula in just this little yellow section right here. So we're not quite to the coast. Okay, the actual center of the impact is right up there on the coast. Um, this map right here is just this section right here. So if we go back and look at the map, you'll recognize some of the things that I talked about. Over here is Merida, the, the big city that I was in. Okay. So the impact site is actually way up here someplace, okay, at the, with the scale of this map. Um, but what's really interesting on this map, I didn't know you could actually see this on a geological map until I printed this one out. And then it kind of blew my mind because I didn't know this at the time. But in Spanish there, there's the ring of cenotes that outlines the actual crater. This is the outer edge of the crater. And all those little spots of water there are holes in the ground. And they make this almost perfect ring right around the crater. And there's a lot more of them off in this direction right here. I'll zoom out a little bit. You can kind of, maybe you can see that if you're looking close, they kind of start over here and the ring extends. I'm trying to trace it here, almost perfectly like that. So the central part of the crater is, is way up here someplace, but that gives you a little bit of an idea, maybe a little bit of scale um, from there. Now let's go ahead and down there what I wanted to show you a second here we're gonna open up some of these boxes I have of material that I brought back from Albion Island so take a look here this is some of the material that rained down and melted and weathered these little pebbles, these round, these are what I was taking out of that cliff side. So little melted fragments of stuff that fell out of the sky. Imagine after this explosion, this impact, way up here in Mexico, being way down in Belize in this burning hot molten stuff raining out of the sky. Got some other things here too. This one's super cool. Actually, check that out. So, wrapped up in wrapped up in Chinese newspaper. How about that? I have no idea what that says. <coughs> this is a pretty cool rock right here. So this side, this is just dolomitic limestone. So it's ancient ocean floor. This is where I broke it off. But the reason I broke this off, it was a much larger rock, was that on this side, you can actually, you can clearly see, I'm gonna try and hold this in the light, not this whitish stuff here, but if you hold it, maybe I'll catch it and look just right in the right glint. You can see these lines right here. Those should kind of remind you of something. Those are striations. And you might remember that striations are formed when glaciers grab cobbles and drag them across the ground and then deposit them, right? Well, this is way down in the tropics. And at this time, there were not glaciers down there in the tropics when this rock was deposited. What caused these striations was this rock was flying through the air after the impact and grinding along the ground as it went before it finally got deposited. So you can picture the, the material just being blown out of this, this crater and then just grinding across the surface of the earth all the way down hundreds of miles away and dropping in Belize. So that one I thought was pretty cool. Let me see what other stuff I've got here.
This might be a little bit of the dimectite, actually. Yep, it is. So this stuff, I'm missing a box. This is that really ground up, kind of crunchy looking dimectite from inside the, from that layer up top above the spheroid bed. But yeah, that's all material from the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Pretty cool, huh?